The major use of aniline is in the production of polyurethane polymers. However, it's also used for many other things, and it's even used for the production of dyes. Its major use by the dye industry is for the production of indigo, which is used to dye jeans blue. Although I might explore these uses in the future, my major purpose of making aniline is for the production of phenylhydrazine. I then plan to use the phenylhydrazine to make scatol. And finally, just as a warning, this experiment does involve the use of nitrobenzene and it produces aniline. Both of these are pretty toxic. So now to list off the chemicals that I used. In terms of reagents, I used 15 milliliters of nitrobenzene, about 85 milliliters of 31.45% hydrochloric acid, and about 34 grams of granulated tin. And I also used about 40 grams of table salt. To a round bottom flask was added 34 grams of granulated tin. To this tin was poured in 15 milliliters of nitrobenzene that I made in a previous video. This was then connected to a condenser and the splashing you see is actually a stir bar attempting to spin. 15 milliliters of 31.45% hydrochloric acid was poured down the condenser. Over the course of the reaction, a total of 85 milliliters of the hydrochloric acid was added. The addition of the hydrochloric acid will start the reaction and the mixture should start to heat up. It will darken to a red or brown color and the mixture might start to boil. This is fine, but if the reaction becomes too vigorous, it might need to be cooled using some cold water. If you ever need to cool it, be sure not to cool it too much and stop the reaction. You want to just make it so it's not as vigorous. Once the reaction seems to be dying down and become not as vigorous, 15 more milliliters of hydrochloric acid is added. This was done repeatedly until a total of 75 milliliters of hydrochloric acid was added. The reaction that is occurring is shown above. The hydrochloric acid reacts with the tin to produce tin chloride, which then reacts with the nitrobenzene to reduce it to aniline. Once all the hydrochloric acid has been added, the mixture is heated on a boiling water bath for 60 minutes. While the reaction was being heated on the hot water bath, a sodium hydroxide solution was prepared. The solution was prepared by adding 100 milliliters of water to 60 grams of sodium hydroxide. The solution was then stirred until all of the sodium hydroxide had been dissolved. To test if the reaction is complete, a little bit of the reaction mixture can be diluted in water. If it fully dissolves and produces a perfectly clear solution, this should indicate that all of the nitrobenzene has been consumed. If the reaction is complete, we can move on by slowly adding the sodium hydroxide solution to the reaction mixture. As more hydroxide is added, the solution will heat up and a precipitate will form. If the reaction becomes too hot, it's important to cool it using an ice bath, and if the reaction becomes too thick, you might have to mix it by manually swirling around the flask. Either way, cool and mix as necessary, but do so until all of the hydroxide has been added. As more hydroxide is added, it will become thicker, but it will reach a point where it starts to liquefy again. The light brown precipitate will disappear and a dark, almost black precipitate will take its place. In this step, we're adding the hydroxide to neutralize any remaining acid, but also to regenerate aniline from its salt form. After all the hydroxide is added, a small oil layer of aniline might separate out, but it's okay if it doesn't. It might remain dissolved or in suspension with the water, and for this reason, to maximize the yield, we're going to have to steam distill it out. Due to sheer laziness and not wanting to have to set up a proper steam distillation, we're simply going to boil the mixture and collect the aniline that comes off. A distillation setup is prepared and the flask is heated on an oil bath. The mixture is then brought to a boil and the distillate is collected. Initially, a white yellow liquid will start to come over. The distillate is murky because it's a mixture of aniline and water. Keep collecting the distillate until it becomes clear, which indicates that the vast majority of aniline has been already collected. However, because aniline is actually a little bit soluble in water, keep collecting 100 mils of the clear distillate. 
At the end of the distillation, a total of 200 milliliters of distillate was collected. To the flask was then added a stir bar. Because, as I said earlier, how aniline is soluble in water, we're going to have to use salt to salt out as much as possible. So, to the distillation flask was added 20 grams of commercial salt per 100 grams of distillate. So, in my case, I added about 40 grams of table salt. This was allowed to be mixed thoroughly and then it was transferred to a separatory funnel. When allowed to stand, a small layer of aniline began to form at the top. The aniline was extracted by washing the mixture three times with 25 milliliters of dichloromethane. The extracted solution was then dried using potassium hydroxide. After stirring for about 20 minutes, the potassium hydroxide was vacuum filtered off and separated. A simple distillation was set up and the dichloromethane was removed. Everything collected below 120 degrees was discarded. When all the DCM had been removed, the flask was replaced with a 50 milliliter flask to facilitate the distillation. The collection flask was then replaced and nothing came over until about 180 degrees Celsius. The fraction boiling between 180 and 184 degrees Celsius was collected. In the distillation flask, we're left with a little bit of brown liquid. The amount of aniline obtained came out to be almost exactly 10 milliliters. The yield of 10 milliliters represents roughly to a yield of about 78%. For me, this is acceptable, but according to the literature, the yield should be much higher. As an interesting side note, the remnants in the distillation flask was actually a pretty potent red colorant.